You guys are great. And welcome to all our online guests. It's so great to have you part of our services. <coughs> okay, so today I'm going to be talking about the pursuit. Now, in case you don't know, the word pursuit means to chase something. It's from the Greek verb dioko, and, and the meaning of that is actually we're running, we're running with effort, we're running with intensity, we're running swiftly to catch something or something. And when we think about it, we're all pursuing something in life, aren't we? We've all got something that we're pursuing. Now, an article I found on the internet, so I don't know how reliable this information is, but it made me laugh. The number one thing people pursue in life are happiness, followed by money, freedom, peace, and fulfillment. And in the pursuit of such things, a human life can become characterized by two things, hurried and worried. <laughs> can anyone relate to that, hurried and worried? I certainly can. You know, and if we just take a moment now just to have an honest think to ourselves, we don't need to shout it out, but let's just have an honest think. What is the number one thing that we spend most of our time and energy pursuing? What is that thing at the forefront of our minds that we're striving for, that we're pursuing? If we just have a little think about that. And then I want us to consider two biblical truths. Number one, that our life here on earth is short. It says in James 4, 14, but you don't have a clue what tomorrow may bring. For your fleeting life is but a warm breath of fresh air that is visible in the cold only for a moment and then it vanishes. Our life here on earth is short. And another biblical truth. One day we're going to be standing before Jesus. We're going to be looking into the face of Jesus and we're going to have to give an account for our life. Revelation 22:12. 12, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming quickly. And I bring my reward with me to repay everyone according to their works. So considering now these two biblical tr truths, let's further ask ourselves, is what I have been pursuing in my life up until this point really that important? And should I be changing the object of my pursuit? So what does the Bible tell us about the object of our pursuit? Well, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 31 to 33, so then, forsake your worries. Why would you say, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For that is what the unbelievers chase after. Doesn't your heavenly father already know the things your body requires? So above all else, above all else, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom and the righteousness that proceeds from him. Then all these less important things will be given to you in abund abundantly. So Jesus is telling us here that the supreme pursuit of a Christian's life should be him, should be his kingdom, his righteousness, and what proceeds from that. You know, kingdom, um, th the Greek word for kingdom is a word called basilia, and it means a person's rule or authority, the kingship of a person. You know, the Jewish people who Jesus was talking to in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas at that time, they were, uh, they were in the kingdom of the Roman Empire. They were under the rule and authority of the Roman Empire. They knew what it was like to be subjects in a kingdom, subject to somebody else's rule and authority. And what Jesus is telling us here is saying, look, don't worry how you're going to survive in this world under, in the presence of, of another rule and authority, in the limitations of this physical world. Because there is a spiritual realm that runs parallel with this physical world that Jesus is king of. And when we spend our time pursuing that and pursuing what it means to be under the rule of Jesus and his dominion and the blessings and, and being his, one of his children under his kingship, when we spend our focus pursuing that, then, then divine providence, divine blessings, divine protections, they're going to flow into our lives, not from a human source. So when we focus on the spiritual realm and the kingship of Jesus, it's going to start flowing in our lives within the physical limitation that we're living in. So you see, our number one aim should not be, how am I going to survive? How am I going to get this in this world? How am I going to, how am I going to? The number one aim should be, how can I get close to Jesus? How can I know Jesus? Because once I do, I know everything else is going to start flowing in my life. Amen? 
And, you know, we might think, well, I do seek God amongst other things. (laughs) I do seek God when I've got time. I do seek God when I get my to-do list done. (laughs) But let's ask ourselves again, uh, together, again this morning, are we trying to fit God into our life or are we surrendering our lives? Are we giving our lives to him as a sacrifice? Romans 12, 1 says, Beloved friends, what should our proper response to God's marvelous mercies be? I encourage you to surrender yourself to God, be his sacred living sacrifice, and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. For this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Are we fitting God into our life where it's convenient? Or are we surrendering every aspect of our life to him? And I know things can get busy. I know that's the reality of it. I'm a a mum of three children. I get busy. (laughs) But why do we have to separate it? Why first this, then God? When I've got this done, then I'll get to God. You know, I used to think it had to be like that, but Jesus never separated it. Jesus never separated it. He was in constant union and fellowship with his father. Whatever he was doing, he was seeking to honor God and do his will in every aspect of his life. Above all else, constantly seek after God above all else. You know, this statement denotes a single focus. It implies that we have to have a single focus. Seek after God and God alone. There's nothing else included in that. It's a single focus. You know, secular businesses, successful ones, they're very good at this. The ones that are well known for what they represent, they're very good at this. Steve Jobs, uh, the co-founder of Apple, he was once quoted saying, people think focus means only saying yes to the thing thing you need to focus on. But it also means saying no to the 1,000 other good ideas that are out there. <laughs> you have to, he says, you have to choose, but you have to choose carefully. You know, Christians should be known for their single focus, pursuit, and representation of God. And it might mean saying no to the 1,000 other things that are out there that are trying to distract us from our pursuit of him. We are called to know him and make him known in this world. But how are we going to make him known well if we don't know him well? And you know, we might be tempted to think, well, that's a big deal. Surrendering everything, surrendering all my life to God, that's a big deal. But you know what? Jesus Christ is a big deal. What he did for us for the redemption of mankind is a big deal. Representing the gospel of Jesus Christ on this earth, having the honor to do that, is a big deal. Pointing someone to the way to salvation is a big deal. Laying hands on the sick and raising the dead is a big deal. And if we're going to do it well, we need to embark on a single, focused, passionate pursuit of God. And what does this look like? We're constantly being aware of his presence within us and around us. Learning about him in his word, learning about his character, studying him, praying with him and just communion with him, just talking to him. Learning to recognize him and his ways and how, learning to look for him in your life and how he's moving. Learning to recognize the stirring of him on the inside of you. And then more importantly, being able to yield to him and let him, letting him have his way in your life. Psalms 14.2 says, The Lord looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. It says in Amos 5, 4, this is what the Lord says to Israel, seek me and live. Is what you're pursuing right now bringing you life? Is what you're pursuing right now bringing you life? You know, I know from experience from many of my earthly pursuits, they lead to dead ends. You know, they lead to being unsatisfied, wanting more, needing more, needing something else to fill that void. It's dead. And there is life to be found in our pursuit of Jesus Christ. He says in John 10.10, A thief only has one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. 
But I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expected, life in its fullness, fullness until you overflow. There is life to be found in Jesus Christ. And he's talking about his life, his Zoe life infused into our inner being, deep to deep, his very life on the inside of us. It's so rich. It's so rich, and he wants to give it us in abundance. You know, the apostle Paul pursued God. He made it his single focus in life. And I want to look at a portion of scripture today that... um, that brings out the benefits for us in pursuing God. And that's Philippians 3, 7 to 10. I'm just going to read that out. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Now before we go into this, I think it's important to also recognize where the pursuit started. Do you know the pursuit didn't start with us? We pursue God because he first pursued us. We pursue God because he first pursued us. You know, the purpose of our creation was for you to be in union with God. And after the the fall uh, of mankind, the, the Bible is stories of God just relentlessly pursuing his people, relentlessly pursuing us. When Adam and Eve first sinned in the garden, they sinned and then they went and hid from God. And it was God that went after them. It was God that went looking for them. Has anyone ever messed up and tried to hide from God? Yeah? (laughs) Well, you can know that God's pursuing you. You can know his relentless love is pursuing you. You might try to hide, but God's pursuing you. Time and time again, when Israel obeyed God, he went after them. He pursued them. He pursued them. He sent Jesus to seek and save the lost. And the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin that we read about in Luke, did this image of, of God just relentlessly pursuing his, his loved, valuable children. And then when one is found, when one repents and comes home, there's this amazing celebration. He's rejoicing that he's found, that one's come home, that he's found one of his children. His love relentlessly pursues us. He pursues us and then he puts the desire in our heart to pursue him. How good is God? He pursues us and then he gives us the desire to pursue him. John 6, 44 says, The only way people come to me is by the Father who sent me. He pulls on their hearts to embrace me. And those who are drawn to me, I will certainly raise them up in the last day. God draws us to himself. And then the rest of our life should be the outworking of living in that relationship with him. He creates the, di- the desire within us. But it's up to us to act on that desire. It's up to us to make the decision to act on that desire. There was a pastor called A.W. Tozer, and he wrote quite a well-known book called The Pursuit of God. And his argument was that once people got saved, found God, they thought their pursuit was over. (laughs) So I found God, um, that's it, it's over. But actually, that was just the starting place. That was just the starting blocks. That was just the point where now we're going to start to pursue him. And what it means, what our salvation means, what it means to be living in relationship with him. That was just the starting blocks. And what are the benefits of pursuing him? Well, the number one reason Paul gives us in the portion of scripture, verse 7 and 8, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul pursued God, forsaking all the things that people would normally boast about, because of the surpassing value, the surpassing worth there is to be found in knowing Christ Jesus, 
There is, there is a surpassing worth that nothing on this earth can compare to. Nothing that we find in this life compares to the value of knowing Christ Jesus. And if we don't have that motivation yet to act on the desire within us to pursue him, then maybe we've just not got the understanding of what there is to be found in him yet. I like how Paul explains it in 2 Corinthians 13. Now, now may the grace and joyous favor of the Lord Jesus Christ, the unambiguous love of God, and the precious communion that we share in the Holy Spirit be yours continually. Amen. What is it to be found in Jesus? Grace, joy, favor, peace, love, communion, fellowship, identification, acceptance. There's so much to be found in him. You know, I don't believe God is happy with us just having a basic knowledge of him. I really don't. The Bible says he wants us to be full of the Holy Spirit. Not, not drunk on wine, but full of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because there's so much more he wants to give us. There is so much more Jesus come to give us. So much more he wants us to experience in our lives. Pro a lot more than probably most of us are experiencing right now. There is so much in him. And he wants us to be able to experience it in our lives as we continually pursue him to know him. <laughs> Philippians 3.1 says, My beloved ones, don't ever limit your joy or fail to rejoice in the wonderful experience of knowing our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever limit yourself. Don't limit your joy by not pursuing to know Jesus. You're limiting yourselves. And we'll only experience him as a reality in our lives to the level at which we pursue him. And the word knowing here, again in the Greek, I'm bringing a bit of Greek out today, is that okay? <laughs> I'm not trying to show off my Greek. I had to look this up. But I'm really just trying to draw the meaning out of some of these words just to help us understand things a little bit better. Knowing in the Greek is a verb, ginosko, and it means through first-hand experience. The, to, probably, probably, to probably know someone through first-hand experience in your life. Because, you know, the Apostle Paul, he, he knew a lot of things about God, didn't he? He knew a lot of facts about God. You know, he was born, he was a Jewish man. He was born into the Jewish heritage, a separated people. For God, he had the mark of circumcision. He was, he was, brought, or he was taught the scriptures his whole life. He knew God and creation. He knew about the Exodus. He knew about the, the wilderness, the tabernacle. He knew about Israel's disobedience. He knew about the history of God and the Israel people. He knew a lot of things about God. In fact, he was a Pharisee. He was separated, um, again, just to, to study and live by the written law. But he says all of that. All of that, that facts, all of that stuff I knew about God, that means nothing compared to a first-hand experiential knowledge of God in his life. It meant nothing. So here's another thought for us today. We can't live off somebody else's relationship with Jesus. We can't live off somebody else's relationship with Jesus. We can't live off second-hand knowledge of Jesus. Yes, we can be ministered to for a time. We can be guided. We can definitely be helped by somebody else in an intimate relationship with Jesus. But if we really want to go far for ourselves, if we really want to go far in the things of God, we need to pursue a relationship with Jesus for ourselves. We can't live off somebody else's relationship with Jesus. So we pursue him because of the surpassing worth of knowing him. And we pursue him in order to know our position in him. Verse 9, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from, from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. We pursue him to know our position in him. How many times in Paul's writing does he describe the Christian believer in Christ? In Christ. We are in Christ. 
we are united to Christ in his death and resurrection. We are in him and we need to understand this position, position in him. Romans 8, 11 says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. What does it mean to be in Christ? It means that when God looks at you, you're identified with Jesus. You, you're connected to him like a branch to the vine, like a member of the body, like a limb of the body. You're connected to him. He is the life source within you, the wellspring of life within you. And when God looks at you, he sees Christ. He doesn't see your failures and, and your sins and, and all your shortcomings. He sees the Savior that died for them. He sees the holy blood you are now covered with. He sees you in Christ. And, you know, this position in Christ is of monumental benefit. You know, we can't make ourselves righteous in the sight of God on our own. But in Christ, we can. We can't get to heaven by ourselves. But in Christ, we can. You can't receive the power and the communion of, of the Holy Spirit on your own. But in Christ, you can. You can't lay hands on the sick and heal them and raise the dead on your own. But in Christ, you can. You can't protect yourselves from the attacks of the enemy on your own. But in Christ, you have the power and the authority to speak life and declare and protect yourself. There is monumental benefit of our position in Christ. Peter, you remember Peter is writing to the church. He was writing to believers. And in 1 Peter 5.8, he says, Be well balanced and always alert because your enemy, the devil, roams around like an incessantly roaring lion, seeking um, whom he may devour. And that's to believers. And I really believe that it's when we've not got a knowledge of who we are in Christ, or when we step outside of that and we begin to walk by the flesh, you know, and our pride and our ego um, starts to take control. We're stepping out of Christ, and I, and I believe we're revealing to the enemy our position. I believe we're, we're making ourselves prime target for him because we've stepped outside of Christ. It's of monumental benefit and importance. You know, I don't know if you're like me, but have you ever thought, my mind goes on these little things, why has God, does God keep us here after our salvation? You know, once we get saved, why don't we just go to heaven? It's because God has now given us a position in Christ and a power and a purpose and an authority uh, to go and make his name great, to go then and seek and save the lost, the continuation of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Again, a big deal. Come on, guys, a big deal. That's what we're here to do. It's a big deal. Build up the body of Christ. It's amazing. And he keeps us here and he gives us that position and that power and his authority and his purpose. John 15, 4 says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much through fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. But, you know, we're not just going to experience all this by just living our life, by just ambling along in our life. Unfortunately, it's not just going to drop on us. We need to intentionally and deliberately choose to pursue God and make them decisions and take them actions and don't rely on others to do it for us. We've got to start pursuing him for ourselves. So we pursue him to know him and we pursue him to know our position in him. And we also, according to the scripture, pursue him to experience the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul longed for a fellowship that included both dynamic experiences of Jesus Christ in his life, but he also wanted difficult experiences. He wanted to experience in the sufferings of Jesus Christ. 
Yes, he wanted to experience the resurrection power in his life, the, the power that enables us to live a victorious life, to live above the norm, the power that enables us to say no to sin, the power that we can heal the sick with and resident, all these brilliant things. Yes, he wanted that. But he also longed for a fellowship in his sufferings. You know, Jesus Christ experienced sufferings in his life, didn't he? He was a man acquainted with sorrows. But there was a purpose to Jesus' sufferings. There was a purpose in it, the purpose to bring redemption to the whole of mankind. And Paul wanted to experience in the sufferings of Jesus to be associated with them and, and connected with them, understand his sufferings so he could understand the person and the purpose better. All the sufferings Paul experienced drove him deeper into relationship with God, deeper into his purpose in Jesus Christ. There was a purpose to the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And when you allow the fellowship of Jesus to be paramount in your sufferings, God will also bring a purpose to your sufferings. And am I saying God brings us sufferings? No, I'm not saying that. The Bible says he is light and in him there is no darkness. It says every good and perfect gift is from above. We live in this fallen world. Unfortunately, sufferings and sorrows and trials, and the, that's all just part of living in this world. But when we allow Jesus Christ, the fellowship of Jesus Christ to be paramount in that, then yes, we'll go through sufferings, but God will work all things for good. God will transform things and just have this beautiful plan of putting purpose in our sufferings. Romans 8, 28 says, So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his design purpose. Jesus Christ was perfected in his sufferings. And it's in these private, personal, raw, weak, vulnerable moments of our suffering that Jesus Christ can pour a love and a grace and a strength into our heart that will transform us, that will transform us into his image. James 1, 2 says, My fellow believers, when it seems as though you're facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy you can. For you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure all things. And then, as your endurance grows even stronger, it will release perfection into every part of your being until, until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. Jesus Christ will bring a purpose to your pain. He will bring a purpose to your sufferings. And, he, and, and in that, he will bring a maturity. He'll bring a transformation. And we come out the other side higher. We come out the other side stronger. We come out the other side better. We come out the other side then as a guide for others who are going through that. We can then be the beacon of light for people to follow on that path. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted with him. Whatever you're going through right now, allow the fellowship of Jesus Christ to be paramount. And, and he'll waste nothing. You know, ironically, it's sufferings in life that can lead to, the one, um, to one of the major perspective shifts that we have about Jesus. Moses' perspective of God was changed in the wilderness. David's perspective of God was changed in the wilderness. Hagar's perspective of God was changed in the wilderness. And Paul's perspective of God was changed in the wilderness. Like we've said, Paul knew a lot of stuff about God. But in the wilderness, God became real to him. And there's a real difference. In his encounter, Paul, with Jesus on the road to Damascus, he asked him two questions. Paul says, who are you, Lord? And once that's established... He asks, what shall I do for you, Lord? <laughs> Once our perspective chains of changes of who Jesus Christ is, we'll want to spend the rest of our lives just passionately pursuing him and serving him. And our question will be, what shall I do for you, Lord? What shall I do for you? 
you know, Paul in the next um, few verses um, of this scripture in Philippians, he goes sort of into this mo- motivational speech about how he goes about pursuing God. And that could well be for another sermon, but I just want to read it to you. Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So Paul is encouraging us, come on, come on, start running with me, start running with passion like me for Jesus. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm ready to start running for Jesus. Are you ready to start running for Jesus? I'm ready to start running for Jesus. (sighs) You know, interestingly, historians um, believe that the book of Philippians was written about 30 years approximately after um, Paul's encounter on the road to Damascus. So that's 30 years, Paul's 30 years in here, he's been saved for 30 years, and he's still, he's still running with passion for Jesus, 30 years down the line, he's still saying, I want to pursue him, it's Jesus, he's my single focus, 30 years in, I, gosh, I hope they're 30 years in, I hope I'm still there, I declare it over myself in Jesus' name. <laughs> 30 years down the line, he's saying, uh, he's saying I've, not, I've not obtained it yet. 30 years down the line, he's saying, there's still more I need to know. There's still more of him I need to know. I still need to grow more. I still need to grow more. But what I'm doing is I'm not looking. I'm forgetting everything that lay behind. I'm not looking at all my past mistakes. I'm not looking at what might look like would disqualify me for, for going, doing big things for God. I'm not looking at any of that. My focus is straight ahead. My focus is on Jesus. My focus is on the pursuit of him. 30 years in. 30 years in, guys. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to start running. Who's ready to start running? Come on. You know, as you know, as a lot of you here know, my brother passed away about five weeks ago now. And, you know, it's been a wilderness time for me and my family. And I was asked by a, um, by a non-believer, quite innocently and quite curiously, well, how does this affect your faith? How does this change your faith? And I thought about it, and I thought, had a little think. I thought, well, it doesn't affect my faith at all. It doesn't affect my faith at all. Yes, I'm hurting. Yes, there's a pain and a process, but God is still the same. God hasn't changed. My relationship with Jesus is still the same. His love for me is still the same. My purpose here on earth is still the same. My destination to heaven is still the same. None of that has changed. But what it has done, the shift that has happened, is it's made the reality of eternity so much more bigger in my heart. The reality that one day I'm going to be standing before Jesus one day you're going to be standing before Jesus. That's the reality of it. And I don't want to have to get there and say, I'm sorry, Jesus. I'm sorry I didn't pursue you like you pursued me. I'm sorry I didn't intensely look for you like you came to seek and save me. I'm sorry, Jesus, that I didn't run for passion like like for you, like you ran with passion for me to that cross. I'm sorry, Jesus. I'm sorry I didn't do that. I want to be able to say, like the Apostle Paul, I fought an excellent fight. Come on. Come on. I've finished my full course, and I have kept my heart full of faith. And now there is a crown of righteousness waiting for me in heaven. Come on. There is a crown of righteousness waiting for us all in heaven. Come on. What do you want to be able to say when you're looking into the face of Jesus? It's the reality, guys. Are you going to be ready to meet Jesus? Are you going to be ready to look into that beautiful face? Do you want to have to say, I'm, I'm sorry, Jesus? I know none of you do. I know you all love Jesus. But we're here now. We're here now, and we can start pursuing all he's got for us. Amen. Let's not waste another day, guys. Okay. 
Paul never come to a place where he'd had enough of him. He didn't get 30 years down the line and say, oh gosh, I've had enough. He didn't. He went deeper and deeper. He wanted more and more. He never gave up his pursuit of God. And I just want to finish with this little story. There was an American swimmer named Florence Chadwick. Some of you may have heard of her. And in 1952, Florence attempted to swim 26 miles between the Catalina Island and the California coastline. After about 15 hours of swimming, a thick fog set in. Florence began to doubt her ability. And she told her mother, who was in a boat alongside her, that she didn't think she could make it. She swam for about another hour before being asked to be pulled out of the ocean, to be pulled in the boat, because she wasn't able to see the coastline due to fog. As she sat in the boat, she found out she had stopped swimming just one mile away from her destination. Don't ever give up your pursuit of Jesus, guys. Because, friends, we're not pursuing a coastline. We're pursuing Jesus Christ. We're pursuing Jesus Christ. Don't ever give up your pursuit of him because you never know how close you are to him. You never know how close you are to seeing him. And your pursuit of Jesus will not be in vain. It will not be in vain. The Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human mind has conceived the things God has prepared for those who loved him, loves him. It will not be in vain. Guys, we have one short life here on earth. And we can live it to pursue our own purposes. Or we can live it in the pursuit of God and his purposes. But the thing is, we must decide. We must choose. And we must choose carefully. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you've not yet made the decision to accept Jesus Christ, if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, if you're not yet on them starting blocks, then you can make that decision today. God has been pursuing you up until this point. Now you can make the decision today to turn to him, and it will be the best decision you ever make in your life. There is so much to be found in Jesus and so much he wants you to experience. Make that decision today for him. I just want to pray if that's you and you want to make that decision today. Then please, can we all just pray together now? Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you that your love has pursued me. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I confess today that Jesus is Lord. And I believe God raised him from the dead. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you've just prayed that prayer for the first time here in this room, then I'd love to speak to you, or Pastor Mel or Pastor Jacob. We'd love to just give you some resources um, and pray over you. And also, if, you've ju if you're online and you've just prayed that prayer for the first time, then you can m comment in, in the live stream and we'll get in touch with you and we'll get some resources to you. Can I just pray for us all? Is that okay? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you for your word today. Lord, I thank you for everybody in this room here. You love them, Father. They're your children. They're so precious and valuable in your sight, Lord. And you have a purpose for each and everyone's life here. You have so much that you want to give them, so much that you want them to experience in, in their lives, Father. And I just pray. I pray that individually and together as a body of Christ, we embark on this passionate pursuit of you, Lord. A just passionate pursuit of you. And we don't stop just because we might, the fog might set in, just because the journey gets long and tiring. We can encourage each other and spur one another on, and we do not stop in pursuit of you. So we can represent you here on earth, Father. It's such an honor, and it's such a privilege to do that. And I want us to do it well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening.